come. Uh, it is my very great pleasure to introduce my colleague to you this evening. Uh, Tristan uh, is lecturer in English literature on the university. I think I'm reading this. I know that. And Tristan's research focuses on connections between literature and political theory in the long 19th century. So do you want to tell people when that starts? <coughs> that about around se the 1780s to the 1910s. <coughs> so 1789 to 1914. Right, so the, the, the historian goes, no! <laughs> anyway, um, and Tristan is interested in literary responses to revolution, as well as the ways in which literature addresses questions of community, violence, and identity. Um, Tristan's recent book, 2022, is on Byronism, Napoleonism, and 19th century realism, heroes of their own lives, question mark, because you're interrogating them. <laughs> and it's a study that uses, um, of the uses which, which Byron and Napoleon are put to in middle class 19th century novel. So I don't know if you're watching the latest film, Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, Napoleon. I probably will at some yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Tristan's also recently published on politicised violence in Charles Dickens and Joseph. He's currently working on a monograph provisionally titled From Terror to Terrorism, Violence, Community and the 19th Century Novel. And um, today Tristan is talking about the French Revolution controversy. It's slightly different from the title um, as advertised because I just invented that for Tristan <laughs> <laughs> because we, we needed to go to the press. So I know Tristan has done some really interesting archival research, so without further ado, over to you, Tristan. Uh -huh. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, thank you to Sue for the invitation, and thank you to Shan and all the archive staff for their help in preparing this talk. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be sort of um, Giving, what I'm going to do today is, um, first of all, kind of give a little bit of a kind of general overview of the kind of res uh, research I'm interested in, the kinds of questions I'm asking um, about what scholars call the revolution controversy, um, which um, I'll sort of introduce as a kind of um, a theme of um, late 18th century uh, English political debate, um, and particularly kind of how it kind of took place in a kind of literary sphere. Um, and then I'll kind of introduce the kind of context of my own research uh, to that. And then in the kind of second part of the talk, once, once I've kind of laid that groundwork, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the bits and pieces that have been shown in, in the archives and special collections here at Bangor. And um, I'm going to be kind of moving um, between um, kind of some very, very canonical texts, which are well represented here in the special collections, and then I'm also um, I'm going to finish by thinking it very, very local to show how uh, the revolution controversy played out in um, a very intriguing incident that took place in the precincts of Bangor Cathedral <laughs> in 1796. Um, so uh, the revolution controversy, for those of you who sort of aren't familiar with this, um, was essentially um, a kind of heated political debate that mostly took place through pamphlets and periodicals um, in the 1790s in response to uh, the French Revolution of um, 1789. Um, and uh, basically kind of everybody who was anybody in the 1790s and writing prose had an opinion on this. You know, the kind of, I guess the kind of most famous participants um, in it were um, William Godwin and his partner Mary Wollstonecraft um, Tom Paine, the American political theorist, and Edmund Burke, the um, formerly Whig MP who turned high Tory as a response to the um, French Revolution. Um, but also it sees um, the, the, the response to the revolution, as well as these kind of quite famous names, just sees this immense volume of prose being produced. The pamph people are writing kind of pamphlets and replying to one another in pamphlets. Uh, kind of endlessly through the um, 1790s. Um, it's been uh, described by David Duff then as a pamphlet war in which politicians and theorists, many of them personally known to one another, battled for the hearts and minds of the British people through the medium of print. Um, and as Marilyn Butler explains, as a public issue, the revolution debate lasted 
for about six years, from the first English rejoicings at France's new dawn in 1789 to December 1795, when William Pitt, the Younger's government, introduced measures to stop the spread of radicalism by the printed and spoken word. Um, so we've got these kind of famous figures in, in the revolution controversy, but we also see kind of produced a huge amount of kind of occasional, um, occasional um, prose as well. Um, and so um, I'm not going to be talking about them today, but in the Bangor archives, there's a huge amount of these kinds of bits and pieces of pamphlets. And alongside some of the things I'm going to be showing you, I looked at kind of clergymen uh, interpreting the French Revolution in light of Old Testament prophecy. Um, I looked at um, I looked at um, various kind of ma ma um, minor figure figures like Arthur Young, the agricultural theorist, uh, writing on um, the French Revolution. Pretty much everybody has an opinion on this sort of stuff, and it's but simultaneously a sort of metropolitan phenomena, but also um, a kind of phenomena that takes place all the way across um, this island and or these islands. Um, and so um, the, um, the, the controversy really begins um, actually a little bit kind of before the full ramifications of the storming of the Bastille um, are kind of realised in 1789. And it's just as much actually about the, an the 100th anniversary of the glorious revolution, of, of so-called glorious revolution of 1688 as it is um, about the French Revolution to start with. Um, and, it really begins with the kind of image in the centre here. Um, Richard Price, um, who's a Unitarian clergyman from South Wales, um, but who um, moves to uh, London. He, he lives in Stoke Newington in, and kind of moves in these kind of radical circles ar around Stoke Newington. Um, and he's a really fascinating figure in his own right, incidentally. Um, he's a, as well as kind of being a kind of key theorist of kind of enlightenment revolution in the, the 1790s. He's also one of the um, pioneers of um, the, the kind of emerging discipline of insurance. Um, he, he's a kind of expert statistician and actuary as well. Um, and I think he's someone actually who, like, you know, the, the pamphlet he writes, which I'll be talking about in a bit later, this course, On the Love of Our Country, is quite famous. Um, but he's someone who I think deserves to be kind of better known for the kind of uh, polymathish um, kind of range of interests um, at the time. Um, and so in response to um, um, Price's, um, Price's um, kind of, it begins as a sermon, a discourse on the love of our country, uh, which is um, organised by the Revolution Society in London, um, both to commemorate the um, 16, uh, 1688 Glorious Revolution, but also to respond to the French Revolution, uh, we see this whole set of kind of pamphlets fly backwards and forwards, which are both responding to one another, um, but also responding to the very rapid developments, uh, development of um, events in France between 1789 um, and kind of 1795, 1796, when um, both new censorship laws are put into place in Britain, but also the revolution kind of starts to calm down a little bit once um, they get rid of Robespierre. Um, and so that uh, um, kind of the most famous kind of interventions here are uh, Edmund Burke's uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France, which is written as a direct response uh, to Rich, uh, Richard Price. And then in response, in turn, to um, Edmund Burke, we see uh, Tom Paine's The Rights of Man. Um, and also kind of kicking around here um, is Godwin's huge philosophical treatise, um, An Inquiry Concerning Political Justice. Um, and this is kind of this is a kind of mass event, really. The, these books have, um, particularly sort of Payne's pamphlet, have absolutely massive reach. They publish um, in authorized editions in huge numbers. They're also pirated in, in very cheap editions as well. Um, and so, for example, the version of Payne that I was looking at in the um, special collections here um, is um, the fifth edition of the Rights of Man. And it's still being published in the that fifth edition comes out in the year of its publication, um, and so as David Duff puts it, reading Burke and Payne and choosing between them was a defining experience of the 1790s. Pretty much every, anyone who is literate, and probably lots of people who weren't literate, have a kind of response to this. Um, and I've got there's this wonderful kind of caricature um, 
here of the contrasted reaction to Paine's pamphlet, uh, where we see a kind of group of, um, of, kind of uh, public figures here reading Paine's pamphlets and often reading the bits which are about themselves in it um, and having various kind of curious reactions. So this one's Edmund Burke here. Um, this one is uh, the, um, the Queen, um, Mary Wollstonecraft here, and so on. Um, and yeah, that is just a wonderful little um, cartoon, Ma Mary Wollstonecraft here, saying there is something like touches of genius in Payne's pamphlet, whereas uh, Edmund Burke responds, if ever I read such an infernal, if ever I read such an infernal book, damn me, here's an insolent fellow for you, and so on. So, so this is this is a kind of a, a mass experience, but it's also a quite strikingly metropolitan experience. So, you know, these kind of popular prints are very much about this kind of London political and literary world. Um, but I think, as I'll be showing a little bit later on um, in today's talk, um, this is something which has kind of um, reverberations right into uh, right um, right it kind of away from the country into Scotland into Wales. Um, outside the kind of centre of London. Um, and I, I want to then talk just a little bit about why I'm so interested in this stuff and, and why I'm interested in, in, interested in it in the context of a kind of longer 19th century history. Um, so as Marilyn Butler writes, the themes and techniques of the 1790s do not disappear but go underground and re-emerge in at least two distinct areas of uh, 19th century controversy. The working class radical movement and its press um, of the post-Napoleonic era and the more specialised, refined, but sometimes notionally radical body of literature known as the Romantic movement. For many of those who afterwards played a part in 19th century controversy, the course taken by the revolution debate was significant, even formative. So this, um, so my kind of interest in this is um, not just about this kind of wonderful, kind of generative moment of the 1790s, but the ways in which it echoes all the way through the 19th century is various other kind of um, radical groups, um, thinkers who work in the, uh, thinkers and writers who work in the kind of legacy of the Romantic movement. Um, it, it, it kind of echoes all the way through the century and kind of re-emerges, particularly each time there's a revolution in France, which happens kind of periodically through the 19th century. Um, kind of on queue every 20 years <laughs> or so up until 1870. So uh, th this kind of debate and uh, some of the ideas that are developed in it are kind of still there in the background, I mean, in kind of figures who span the 19th century, like Carlyle, but you can see the kind of echoes of them in kind of right at the end of the 19th century in kind of Joseph Conrad and Henry James's treatment of kind of anarchist terrorists, that they're still, at least in some way, kind of... Uh, echoing the kind of politics which begins to be developed in the 1790s. Okay, so that's something about the um, revolution controversy, and I just want to then kind of put that into the context of my own research ahead of kind of looking at how that plays out um, in some of the texts that I'm looking at. And so I, I suppose I'm particularly interested in the way in which um, the revolution controversy kind of um, raises this kind of conjunction of uh, the connection between violence and community. Kind of revol revolution is is kind of um, definitionally a kind of violent event, and um, the French Revolution is an enormously violent event, and um, and this I suppose kind of takes its most kind of striking form um, under um, the rule of the Committee of Public Safety headed by Maximilien Robespierre um, in kind of from 1792 to 1792. And Robespierre writes in one of um, his um, speeches to the um, National Convention in 1794 that the mainspring of popular government in peacetime is virtue. The mainspring of popular government in revolution is both virtue and terror. Virtue without which terror is disastrous, terror without which virtue is powerless. Terror is nothing but prompt, severe, inflexible justice. It is therefore an emanation of virtue. I mean, it's a remarkable kind of example of circular reasoning, and, it, and it's quite kind of shocking to read in, it, in, in the way in which it kind of yokes together these kind of concepts. 
But I think this is also why it immediately kind of takes us into the realm of literature, right? Because Robespierre is doing something very, very interesting with language here, in which he's kind of forcing words to take on new meanings um, in kind of different sorts of contexts. And this, of course, is the kind of most extreme example of it, but it, it's one um, that kind of these words just echo all the way through uh, far less extreme um, thinkers um, on the kind of revolutionary side. They also echo through uh, the kind of anti-revolutionary reaction as well. That these words are being, these words are kind of interesting from a kind of literary point of view because they are being litigated both in France but also in the kind of pamphlet wars of, of um, 1790s um, Britain. And for me, this is kind of particularly striking because it's this sort of extreme example of Robespierre saying there is a relationship between uh, political community and violence here. The mainspring of popular government is terror in revolution. So he makes this kind of connection between, between violence and kind of uh, some idea of kind of political community here and a political community's kind of claim to rule. But the fact that this is kind of the most extreme example of it means that we, I think there's been a kind of tendency to overlook the ways in which kind of violent, the, this relationship between violence and community is kind of activated in more moderate thinkers. So, I mean, a, a very kind of typical um, and excellent kind of um, um, book on, on the kind of, on some of the kind of pro-revolutionary writers in uh, writing in English at the time, uh, Gary Kelly's The English Jacobin Novel, 1790-1805. Uh, Kelly writes that the English Jacobins abhorred violence and even in the early 1790s saw it only as a last resort. Like most 19th century reformers, the English Jacobins stopped short of advocating violence, which in any case they thought was not vindicated by history. There's this, um, I mean it's true, but there's also this sort of rush to to um, kind of say, well, my, my object of study here, don't worry about them, they weren't violent, they weren't like, they weren't like the Jacobins in France. Um, and this question, I think, has really been kind of opened up recently. There's been quite a lot of kind of scholarship kind of across the board on the relationship between politics and violence um, recently. I think partly kind of motivated by developments in post-colonial um, criticism and the, the legacy of France Fanon, um, but also looking back to the French Revolution. And so, for example, the French um, historian uh, Sophie Varnick um, has recently uh, kind of pointed out that people don't, people have uh, tended to kind of avoid interrogating this kind of question of violence by ra very rapidly condemning it. Um, she writes that we are no longer in an age in which different standpoints argue over an event that resists interpretation, but rather one of unquestioned detestation of the event. The French Revolution is a figure of what is politically intolerable today, as it had already become in 1795. <coughs> the event's character as a political laboratory, as a place where different interpretations of the connections between community and violence take place, is eroded in favour of a moral question, that we foreclose on the question of, of debate about community and violence uh, by taking the kind of most extreme example of it, which means that we sometimes, for example, excuse the English Jacobins of, of, of um, kind of excuse the English Jacobins by saying, oh, they weren't interested in violence, they weren't interested in violence, when actually they, have, they are quite committed to violence, or violence finds its kind of uh, emergence in their rhetoric, even as it's declaimed in, in the kind of statements um, that they make. Um, and I mean, I just want to sort of demonstrate the ways in which this kind of question of violence is a, is a political laboratory. Laboratory. In a whole uh, load of different, um, uh, different statements on this kind of question of terror, so we've got, for example, E.P. Thompson in The Making of the English Working Class uh, quoting a um, kind of um, old radical in the 1860s sort of saying, I have not forgot the English reign of terror. There you have the source of my political tendencies. Um, so so uh, terror is not, at the time, it's not necessarily something that's um, immediately attached just to the French revolutionaries. It's also attached to Pitt's government. 
terror is defended by various writers. It's sometimes defended even while it's uh, kind of disclaimed. Um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of problem word rather than something that has a kind of clear, simple definition. Similarly, sort of Edmund Burke in um, Reflections on the French Revolution uh, writes that under the terror of the bayonet and the lamppost and the torch um, to their houses, the members of the National Assembly are obliged to adopt all the crude and desperate measures suggested by clubs composed of a monstrous medley of all conditions, tons, and nations. Again, we've got this association between forms of community and forms of violence, but we've also got this question of where is the violence actually coming from? Again, it, the question gets shut down if you say, oh, the reign of terror, it was a kind of bad moment of violence. Where is the violence coming from? Who is committing it? What are its political purposes? Um, Godwin, similarly, um, and, and I think Godwin is the kind of particularly interesting example here. Uh, Godwin, on the one hand, uh, says, uh, writes in the preface to Caleb Williams, terror was the order of the day, referring to Pitt's government. But then he also has this band of thieves uh, who live in a kind of utopian community who the novel praises for their exercise of terror in a very sort of odd way. Each of them had cast off control from established principle, a very good Godwinian, Godwinian value, throwing off control from established principle. Their trade was terror, and their constant object was to elude the vigilance of the community. People, even people who criticise terror on the one hand defend it on the other. This is um, um, all that we can sort of say is that there is this kind of endless plurality of definitions of what these words even mean before you even kind of consider what the political morality of this issue is. It's very hard to actually come to any kind of conclusions about political morality because nobody is so using the same words in quite the same way, which is what makes this a kind of interesting literary problem as much as anything. Um, and similarly, I, I won't read all this out, but we see this kind of play out if you just kind of look at OED, that these words terror and terrorism really, really rapidly change their meanings over this period, uh, kind of from from the kind of way in which we use it in an everyday sense, being frightened, uh, taking on this kind of idea of kind of state-sanctioned political violence, but then very <coughs> rapidly turning into a kind of forms of dissident violence and, um, and kind of uh, violence which is associated with um, resistance to political power, and eventually kind of coming round to take on the kind of modern meaning of terrorism that we use in everyday speech as well. It's a hugely kind of uh, shifting field of kind of the meaning of words here. Okay, so that's kind of something, a little something about my research. I just want to turn now to some of the interesting stuff that I looked at and how it kind of echoes some of these concerns. And how am I doing for time? Yeah, good. <laughs> Spot on. Um, so I sort of started here um, with um, Richard Price's A Discourse on the Love of Our, love of our Country, Third edition of 1790, again, it goes through several editions very, very quickly. It kind of attests to just how many people are reading it. <coughs> and, and also, it's, just, it's sort of worth mentioning that lots of these are published by really kind of major publishers of the late 18th century. Uh, Thomas Cadell, in this case, who also published people like Francis Burney um, and um, but the, the other figure who will come up in a bit is Joseph Johnson, who publishes um, Woods and Craft. Um, employed William Blake, um, gets put in prison for um, publishing um, seditious libel and so on. Um, so, um, I mean, um, just to kind of give you a sense, sense of Richard Price then, I've just kind of selected right at the end, the kind of end of his sermon where, where he reflects on what he's seeing in, in the French, the beginnings of the French Revolution in late um, 1789, early 1790. Um, what an eventful period is this, he writes. I am thankful that I have lived to it, and I could almost say, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. I have lived to see a diffusion of knowledge which has undermined superstition and error. I have lived to see the rights of men better understood than ever, and nations panting for liberty, which seem to have lost the idea of it. I have lived to see 30 millions of people indignant and resolute, spurning at slavery and demanding liberty with an irresistible voice, the king led in triumph and an arbitrary monarch surrendering himself <coughs> to his subjects. 
After sharing in the benefits of one revolution, I have been spared to witness of two other revolutions, both glorious, the American Revolution and the uh, French Revolution. And already, right, we're in the, you know, the American Revolution is also a violent revolution. We're already in this kind of question of what makes a glorious revolution? What is its relationship to violence? What is its relationship to political community? 30 millions leading an arbitrary king. Um, and for Burke, for Edmund Burke, of course, this is a kind of violent event. Um, for um, for Richard Price, it is literally it is literally non-violent. It's like the the question of what even constitutes violence here um, is in question. Um, but he's also thinking very much about the ways in which kind of community itself um, is um, is produced here. Uh, what is the kind of if revolution is in some way about producing the community? How does that happen? And um, for Price, this is a kind of question of individuals forming together some sort of community, so that individual um, individual interest and common interest kind of uh, kind of go into sync with one another. Uh, thus, we shall promote in the best manner our own private interest as well as the interest of our country. For what for when the community prospers, the individuals that compose it must prosper with it. But should that not happen, or should we even suffer in our secular interest by our endeavours to promote the interest of our country, we shall feel a satisfaction in our own breasts, which is preferable to all this world can give, and we shall enjoy the transporting hope of soon becoming members of a perfect community in the heavens. There's something kind of millenarial about this. There's also something, I think, that's quite interesting about cal calculated individual risk that ties into uh, these questions of insurance. A discussion for another day. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I wonder, so, um, I mean, it's worth sort of noting here that, um, and I'll say a little bit more about this as we go on, pretty much everything that I looked at in the special collections, um, they're extraordinarily kind of clean um, prints of the, uh, of the books. There's very, very little annotation, particularly, um, very, very little marginalia. Um, they, they look very kind of nice, clean pages, essentially. Um, si similarly with um, the copy of uh, Tom Paine's Rights of Man, um, which is, again, a very, very little marginalia, but a lot of evidence of handling. This was a book that at various points has been read very, very thoroughly. You, you can see sort of, there's a lot of kind of dog-earing uh, of the pages. There's a lot of kind of staining of the pages um, as well. Um, and I'll kind of get onto why that might be um, a little later. Um, but again, in, in um, pain, we get all these sorts of kind of questions of what actually constitutes violence in a revolutionary context and what is its relationship to kind of political community. Um, so for, for example, on uh, page 22 of The Rights of Man, we hear um, Payne remark that uh, what Edmund Burke considers a response to the French Revolution, that of bring, uh, sorry, considers as a reproach to the French Revolution, that of bringing it forward under a reign more mild than the preceding ones is one of its highest honours. The revolutions that have taken place in other European countries have been excited by personal hatred. The rage was against the man, and he became the victim. But in the instance of France, we see a revolution generated in the rational contemplation of the rights of man. It's interesting, though, that he says that the rage was against the man in other revolutions, which kind of implies that even rational contemplation has some sort of relationship to rage here once a revolution um, begins. And similarly, we get this kind of vision of a society where kind of individuals produce a community in this kind of, in this, uh, kind of backwards and forwards motion. Um, every man is a proprietor in society and draws on the capital as a matter of right. From these premises, two or three certain conclusions will follow. First, that every civil right grows out of a natural right, or in other words, is a natural right exchanged. Secondly, that civil power, properly considered as such, is made up of the aggregate of that class of natural rights of man, which becomes defect, uh, defective in the individual in points of power and answers not his purpose, but when collected to a focus, becomes competent to the purpose of everyone. We see again this kind of notion of a movement from kind of the individual to the community. And so we've got kind of being interrogated here. How are communities composed? How, how are they 
put together. And I suppose we might think here about the ways in which kind of the individual reading of the pamphlets might be kind of associated with the kind of production of um, the community there. Um, and finally, um, from the kind of classics of, of this debate, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about Godwin's inquiry concerning political justice. And my photographs of this um, in the special collections don't really do um, don't really do uh, justice to what a kind of handsome book this is. And I'm very aware that we, uh, like you know, I think for some of the other talks which uh, kind of look at um, kind of earlier moments in literary history, particularly, you get some kind of magnificent images. Um, and by the time that we're into the 1790s, there's a lot of white pages with black text on. <laughs> so they're, they're not kind of the prettiest things to look at. But this is, this is a, a, it's a very fine book. It's a, it's a large kind of quarto volume. Um, and it was ex astonishingly expensive. And as Butler, uh, Marilyn Butler tells us, Godwin and his friends believed that it was not prosecuted by Pitt's government on account of its price. 36 shillings for the first edition, a quarto, not three guineas as in early versions of the stories, and 14 shillings for the latter octavo editions. There was a, um, certainly there was this kind of attitude in the government that if this couldn't get into the hands of ordinary people, even though it was a kind of politically dangerous um, text, um, it didn't pose any great threat to uh, established power. Um, and um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's again, um, probably unsurprisingly, given how expensive it was, there's very, very little evidence of it kind of, well, it might also be even rather dry, there's very little evidence of it being read, uh, let alone <laughs> annotated. It, it's in very, very good condition, indeed. Um, and so I think it's sort of worth kind of pointing on this, because we, when we kind of, you know, we talk about, and again, this kind of comes back to different definitions of violence. The, the kind of Robespierre, that Robespierre speech is kind of shocking, but it, I think it also needs to be put alongside the kind of repressive measures that were kind of put in place uh, by the kind of constituted established government of Britain at this time, which was kind of actively involved in arbitrary detention, putting people on trial on spurious grounds, often with um, often with the kind of um, death penalty attached to it, with major treason trials in 1794, um, the violent breaking up by the army of, of popular protests. But violence is not something that simply belongs to the French Revolutionary government. It's also something that belongs to the kind of, uh, kind of constitutionally established government of Britain as well. Um, and alongside that kind of physical violence, there's also all sorts of other kind of repressive measures that are put into place. Um, and one particularly, I think, uh, which kind of speaks to the uh, ways in which we might, as kind of contemporary readers, come across the, these 1790s texts. Um, and that was um, kind of a quite strict regime of censorship, in part by controlling the price of books. Um, the Attorney General, Eldon, um, who, um, for those of you who are familiar with the Peterloo Massacre, talking of violence, turns up again in Shelley's Mask of Anarchy as one of the people who justifies uh, the state violence in the P at the Peterloo Massacre. The Attorney General Eldon applied an explicit policy of restricting access by price, uh, writes William St. Clair in The Reading Nation of the Romantic Period. As he wrote to Thomas Cooper, um, another radical writer who published a reply to Mr. Burke's invective in 1792, <coughs> continue, if you please, to publish your reply to Mr. Burke in octavo form so as to confine it probably to that class of readers who may consider it coolly. So soon as it is published cheaply for dissemination among the populace, <coughs> it will be my duty to prosecute. <laughs> the heavy tax, uh, and then St. Clair goes on, the heavy taxes on paper and advertisements were progressive in the sense that the bigger the book, the bigger the tax. But the stamp duties on pamphlets and newspapers, so the cheap literature, on the other hand, were flat rate and regressive, not so much mean, uh, not so much means of raising revenue as targeted attacks on reading matter, which the state most feared. All books below a certain size were taxed at the flat rate of sh three shillings per copy, equivalent to a third of the weekly wage of a working man. And I think this perhaps provides one answer 
why um, some of even the kind of um, even the kind of pain and price pamphlets are not kind of um, kind of heavily annotated or used as kind of scrap paper in any way, which is um, that they were kind of they were pretty expensive for what they were. Uh, perhaps you know we don't know, but perhaps even kind of pride, they would have been prized possessions for some people, presumably uh, to be read over and over again, but to have that kind of monetary value recognised as well. Um, strikingly, one of the few um, texts, at least that I consulted, um, um, which does um, have kind of uh, any kind of marking on it, um, is a anti-revolutionary text. Uh, Richard Watson, who was Bishop of Llandaff, um, a charge delivered to the clergy of the Diocese of Llandaff, June uh, 1798. Um, I mean, the stuff on the title page here, I'm, I'm no paleographer whatsoever, but I'm pretty sure that's a much later hand. Um, and, but I can't, like, my, my ability to read old handwriting isn't good enough to make out um, what it says whatsoever. But very, very um, interestingly, there's this kind of interesting kind of piece of error, what I presume is an, uh, kind of, um, an error in printing, um, where um, the Bishop of Llandaff asks, Will our laws become impartially administered, implying that the laws aren't currently <laughs> impartially administered? Um, and this word become has been crossed out um, and replaced by be more impartially administered. Um, and very, uh, and I kind of um, looked this up, and on a couple of the scans of it that I kind of found online, uh, there's two copies in the British Library one which isn't corrected, and another which is corrected in a different place, but I think perhaps in the same hand. And so I'm wondering whether it was kind of corrected um, in press um, by hand at some point, rather than kind of relying on some sort of errata list at, at the front there. Um, and I just thought that might be an intriguing little question to go and clear up at some point, if it's clearable, upable. Um, but, with, uh, but with the uh, with the British Library catalogue down at the moment, as some of you might have noticed, um, I wasn't going to be able to kind of get started on that um, in the preparation of this talk. Um, and so that kind of takes us on to the kind of more local, uh, which is the Bishop of Clandaff. And um, it's very interesting that Jean showed me these kind of two um, kind of um, bound sets of kind of pamphlets from this time. Um, and um, most of them were in English, but we do get two which have been very, very cheaply printed um, in Welsh. Um, and um, I think one of the kind of quite intriguing kind of things to note here is that we can see um, in the context of the kind of Welsh Revolution controversy um, that this kind of goes right down to what's the, what's the Welsh word that you use for revolution, right? So um, here we get a kind of calc of revolution. Um, but um, here, um, in the other one, we get um, the merit the art. Um, so we've got these kinds of, um, we've got this kind of debate, even if we can see this kind of debate playing out um, about um, even kind of what the word for, for revolution is. Uh, um, and um, I suppose the other kind of striking um, things um, here are just how um, the kind of web the kind of Welsh publications are tested, how this was kind of debated at the local level. They're both anti-revolutionary um, texts, um, and both kind of make a particular link between non-conformism and anti-revolutionary beliefs. That the French Revolution is treated as something that's strongly Catholic, whereas the settlement of um, the 1680s, it's argued, uh, means that there is no need for a second revolution in Britain. Um, because um, the rights of dissenters have been secured already. Um, and I want to kind of finish by turning to Bangor and something which is kind of brings together all these themes of violence, community, nationwide discussion um, in a kind of quite comical form um, with uh, a kind of uh, an account of a trial on the one hand and a satirical poem. Um, that responds to it, and these are kind of bound one after the other. Um, so I want to start first um, with this um, account of the trial at Shrewsbury, the trial of the Bishop of, of Bangor and others before Mr Justice Heath at the Assizes at Shrewsbury on Tuesday, July the 16th, 1796. 
for an assault rants and riots. Mm -hmm. With pleadings at large of councillors Adam and Erskine, also the charge to the jury by Mr Justice Heath, published in London. This, this was something that was being discussed in London. And uh, the Bishop of Bangor at the time is um, shown here in a portrait attributed to Gainsborough. Um, John Warren, 1730 to 1800, and Bishop of Bangor for the last kind of 17 years of his life. And it's worth just mentioning in passing um, that um, he was, um, during Pitt's ministry, he voted for the repressive measures against um, um, supporters of the French Revolution, including uh, voting in the House of Lords for the suspension of the Vias Corpus in 1794. Um, and um, his trial, um, you might be interested to know, um, for um, he was acquitted, but his trial for assault, rout, and riot um, is not mentioned in his entry in the Dictionary of National Biography <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> um, so what happens? Well, the account of the trial tells us something about what he's charged with. The first count stated that Samuel Grindley, gentleman, was on the 8th of January last and still is Deputy Register of the Episcopal and Consistorial Court of the Bishop of Bangor, and lawfully appointed to the office, and being such deputy, um, he had, a, a, be had, and of right ought to have, the use, occupation, and enjoyment of a certain office room or apartment adjoining to the Cathedral Church of Bangor, called the Register's Office, for the purpose of exercising and transacting the benefits of his office. Such was the first count of the indictment. The second count stated that the Bishop of Bangor and the other defendants, well knowing these facts but being ill-disposed persons and devising and intending to disquiet and disturb Mr. Grindley in the execution of his office, and forcibly, violently and unlawfully to expel and remove him from that office and to molest and trouble the King's peace and tranquility of the Kingdom, did on the 8th of January last with force of arms riotously, routously, and unlawfully assemble and congregate with many others to disturb the peace. And being so assembled, riotously and unlawfully broke the register office and remained there for an hour against the will of the said Samuel Grindley. And during that time made a great noise and disturbance there and terrified Mr. Grindley and his servants and assaulted Mr. Grindley and threatened him with loss of life, etc., and affirmed that, affirmed that Mr. Grindley unlawfully and unjustly assumed the office of deputy register of this place. And so, I mean, it goes on. Um, so, um, I mean, what happened here? Um, well, the trial account tells us that in 1792, Samuel Grindley was appointed agent to the bishop and soon after deputy register. The latter office was afterwards confirmed by Mr. Gunning, the minor and register, come back to that, and Mr. Grindley continued quietly possessed of it till autumn 1795, when the general election was supposed to be approaching. At this time, the bishop began to exert his influence in Carnarvonshire for a particular friend, and applied to Mr. Grindley for his vote and interest. But Mr. Grindley, in the true spirit of independence which characterises Englishmen, resolved to remain firm in supporting the parliamentary candidate whom his heart approved. From this period, the bishop conceived a great antipathy towards Mr. Grindley. It seems that they had a huge falling out about politics, but it's sort of worth mentioning here that this Grindley ended up being deputy registrar of the cathedral because the bishop had appointed his underage nephew to the position. And so, not, so the actual registrar, not being legally of age, couldn't transact any of the business of the cathedral, and so this Grindley character had to be appointed to, as someone who was of age to actually, uh, actually um, carry out the business of um, the, regist uh, the registrar, um, which seems to be particularly kind of involved in, as I understand it, registering wills, divorces, marriages, and, <coughs> and so on, and, and administrating the ecclesiastical courts. Um, and so they have this huge falling out about politics, um, which ends in um, a, basically a kind of all-out fight. Um, um, the, all the assault on Grindley was... Um, sorry, so let's, I'll come back to that. So it sort of ends in this kind of all-out fight, 
which apparently um, involves, um, let me find my notes on this, um, it ends up involving about 40 people, this fight outside the uh, registry office of Bangor Cathedral, including the archdeacon, a constable, <laughs> uh, Mrs. Warren, the bishop's wife, who eventually breaks it up, uh, Mr. Grindley and his clerks, who repossess the office after they've been thrown out of it armed with pistols. <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds like it sounds like kind of quite the event. Um, and it's what's very interesting about all of this is that the council for the defence, so representing the um, bishop, um, is Thomas Erskine, a very very famous lawyer of the period. Um, who in fact um, was known primarily for defending radical causes. Um, so Erskine uh, very famously defended um, the members of the um, London Corresponding Society, the radical organisation, when they were prosecuted by Pitt's government for treason in 1794, uh, Thomas Harvey, John, uh, John Horne Took, and John Selwall, and, and William Godwin was also wasn't charged, but was heavily involved um, in this prosecution as well. But in this case, Erskine is defending um, the Bishop of Bangor. And he, um, what's very striking about this is that in his kind of summing up, he doesn't just associate um, this kind of dis disagreement with kind of the local politics of a corrupt electoral system, but places it into the context of the revolution debate. Um, so um, in his summing up, um, Erskine said that Grindley, who actually begun the riot, said he wished for peace, and at the same time clapped his hand on his pistol. But the bishop sent for a magistrate, and is that proof that he wished for riot? If a verdict is given for the, Mr Grindley, then men in future will be afraid of stepping forward to quell riots, lest they themselves should be indicted, like the bishop, for having begun it. And then he goes on. Pamphlets and libels had been plentifully circulated against the bishop, and the prose this prosecution was only part of a system of calumny employed against his lordship. The whole priesthood even were attacked, and the necessity of sweeping them away, as had been done in France, was urged for their, inter for their interference in temporal concerns. For the same purpose in the beginning of the French Revolution, the massacre of St. Bartholomew was acted on the stage of Paris for the purpose not of exciting horror of the massacre itself, but of creating detestation of the whole priesthood, and the speedy consequence was the destruction of the Bishop of Paris, one of the best men in Europe, and so on. This is placed really explicitly, not just in the context of local politics, but in the context of the French Revolutionary Controversy, and this comes out even more strongly in a satirical poem which uh, follows the account of the trial, um, which um, it, seemed, it was published anonymously. It's called The Battle of BNGR, the, B -N -G -R, the <laughs> Battle of Banga, or The Church's Triumph, a comic heroic poem in nine cantos. Um, and a very little digging, um, to, uh, it took very little digging to find out that this was written by uh, Alexander Getz. Um, who was a kind of fascinating figure, as I, as I kind of conceive in his own right. He was a Scottish Roman Catholic priest and theologian, translator of Horace and of um, the Old Testament, um, but also um, seems to have been kind of right on the kind of uh, acceptable fringes of the Catholic Church in his support for uh, kind of liberal and revolutionary causes. Um, and um, I'd like to find out a little bit more about him. And he writes this really quite wonderful poem in the kind of Horace and Pope's rhyming couplet, heroic couplet style. It's, ra it's rather good, actually, as these things go. Um, I'll, I'll ju so just to give you a kind of taste of it. Um, the peerless prelate who with well-aimed thrust lay the presumptuous layman in the dust, chased from the precincts of the sacred fane a registrar, rebellious, rash, and vain, who dared against heaven uplift his lawless rod and bid defiance to the sons of God, I sing. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it, it's, it's well written, as kind of poems in heroic couplets go. Uh, and it's also, there's some kind of quite amusing little annotations, like there's a, a quite kind of lame joke here about the bishop liking the company of young women. 
Beside him lay his holy limbs to warm, a female grace with every female charm. And someone had written, good. <laughs> um, so, um, but again, what's really interesting um, is that Get again puts this even more strongly into the context of the French Revolution debate. So, um, this Samuel Grindley, who becomes Grindelius in the um, poem, rising from his chair and putting on an oratorial air with all the fervour and harmonious tones of fluent fell, fell wall and prophetic Jones, the fire of freedom burning in his breast, these bold and energetic words address. So Grindley here in the kind of uh, comic poem becomes a kind of rap kind of becomes very, very explicitly a radical thinker associated with the members of the London Corresponding Society who are put on trial. He's compared to Thelwall. Um, he, um, um, he's also compared to um, Jones, uh, to John Ball Tuck as well, and he uh, inveighs against the corruptions of the Tory court. Revenge, revenge, with one um, assent they cry, we will the bishop and the devil defy. Before next sun has beamed on Bangor's towers, the important fortress shall again be ours. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that kind of really kind of brings it to an end. I think we kind of moved from this kind of question of the kind of litigation of these words around violence in uh, kind of 1790s pamphlet literature right up to a kind of comic uh, kind of working out of this a little bit later in 1796. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And, um, <laughs>